In 701, Assyria then, as we read today, under Sennacherib, advanced westward to punish the rebels. In the process, he captured 46 towns in Judah, imprisoned Hezekiah in Jerusalem, and withdrew upon the receipt of a bribe. But it was a temporary withdrawal. Sennacherib returned and demanded the unconditional surrender of the city. Vigorous work on the part of Isaiah and the king Hezekiah prevented this calamity. And that was the prayer that we read this morning, chapter 37. As a result, the city of Jerusalem was preserved for another century of moral and spiritual development. Immediately following that experience is the period of Hezekiah's sickness and recovery, and then his folly, in which Isaiah warns against putting trust in Egypt and urges once again faith in the God of Israel. Now in 2 Isaiah chapters 40 to 55, the year 722 during Isaiah's ministry in Judah, the Assyrians carried off the Israelites living in the northern kingdom and split the territory into two districts which were placed under Assyrian rule. In 605, Judah was brought under Babylonian domination. 605, the year of Judah's Babylonian domination. And in 586, the Babylonians destroyed Jerusalem after she made a bid for independence. She made her bid for independence in 586 and was destroyed by Babylonia. The people of Jerusalem were then brought to Babylonia marking the beginning of the period of exile. Can you imagine such a terrible thing happening today in the United States of America? Our people being carried off, carried off to foreign lands and foreign nations. But do you realize, as I have said, that our children are exiled, exiled from the flowing stream of truth, exiles from the great spirit of freedom and light, conquered and taken over, slaves not knowing they are the conquered, that they are the conquered, that they are the slaves, that they are the enslaved. Can you imagine such devastation? And it is through this forgettery, the manipulation of the subconscious mind has resulted in the same exile today. You are prophets going forth to a land that might as well be Babylonia as Israel. You're going to preach to an exile people to call them to return to the Emmanuel and to look to the government of Almighty God to be upon his shoulders. You're calling them to come home to the secret chamber of the heart, the real inner city of light, and meditate upon the Lord day and night and be filled with his light, be sanctified for that battle of Armageddon that will surely come when they will be given the final opportunity to overthrow this bondage. The year 605 also marked the final and absolute destruction of the Assyrian army and empire after the destruction of Nineveh by the Medes. Now we read of Assyria's destruction and of her king being destroyed by his two sons when he went home. There was an amazing episode that occurred as the angel of the Lord smote the Assyrian hosts. A hundred and four score and five thousand. The angel of the Lord held out his hand and they were dead in the morning. And suddenly, as quickly as Assyria rose, Assyria was destroyed. From within, from the Lord God. It was destroyed because the Lord God spoke it through Isaiah. This shows you the power of the word. 
Isaiah was God incarnate. Things equal to the same thing are equal to each other. He was so full of the light of God that the light that descended from the central sun that came became crystallized as Christ in him delivered the word of judgment and in a matter of days, hours, and years, it was so. Assyria destroyed, Judah carried off to Babylon, Israel divided. All that he said came to pass because the word of the Lord spoke it. Now we look to the chapters in the final portion of the book and we will see that the same word of the Lord that decreed the descent of this dark cycle of karma also decreed the new Jerusalem and the Aquarian age. So with the evidence of the fulfillment of one half of the prophecy, does this not give us the faith in the miracle that Sanat Kumara spoke of? We have seen a miracle, a small miracle. Now we will anticipate the greater miracle. Before we take up those chapters of great and inspired prophecy, let us finish this history. The chapters of 2nd Isaiah 40 to 55 cover 2nd Isaiah's ministry. Whoever 2nd Isaiah is, between the years 545 to 538, and then a number of years thereafter. The first eight chapters, 40 to 48, take place in Babylonia. During this period of time, Isaiah worked to bring about the return of those exiled in Babylonia to Jerusalem and to restore social order by the power and love of the one God. Isaiah was contemptuous of Babylon's idols and religious system. He saw Babylon as a tired, worn-out nation that had lost its dynamic due to materialism and idol worship. He saw the newer order emerging out of the old. He saw it clearly around the pillory fire. The critical events that influenced the period of Isaiah begin with the death of Nebuchadnezzar, 642, the able king of Babylonia. After his passing, the empire began to break up. In 545 BC, Cyrus the Great, king of the Medes and Persians, gained control of Asia Minor. It was at this time that Isaiah, who considered Cyrus to be God's instrument for the release of the exiles, began the first part of his ministry. He began to arouse the Jewish exiles to return to Jerusalem, return to the city four square, return to the inner community, to worship the one God. The second part of Isaiah's ministry began after 538, when Cyrus entered the gates of Babylon, the greatest commercial city in the world, and he entered unopposed, without need to resort to arms, Cyrus granted permission to all exiles of every race to return to their homes. Isaiah continued to preach the idea of restoration in chapters 49 to 55 in part. Most of the Jews stayed in Babylonia. They had no need to go home. They had everything they wanted. Cyrus stood and gave them their freedom to go and they remained in that captive nation. You will stand in the midst of the people and preach the word. Some will come into the secret chamber of the heart with Jesus Christ, and they will know the meaning of the holy city, and others will stay on the periphery of life and say, it was an interesting lecture, a dynamic speaker, but I have other things to do. They pay you no credit, nor me any credit, when they give glib compliments and yet do not do the word. We're not interested in being called good speakers or bad speakers. I have been called both, and it doesn't matter. I don't know how to deliver the word any other way. And the people of light stay and hear it 
and those who want intellectual entertainment without commitment, they go away and say, what a terrible speaker. So is the comment of the world. So although this part of Isaiah is written against a Palestinian backdrop, it is not certain whether Isaiah was in Judah, in the holy city of Jerusalem, or in Babylonia. The third part of Isaiah's ministry, or the ministry of his word, takes place after 538. The keynote of this section is the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed speaking of that living Christ. As we said, many scholars believe that these chapters 56 through 66 are by another author or authors still, a third set of authors. These chapters are believed to have been written between 516 and 444 with the view of Palestine in the background, although Babylonia is clearly the subject and it could have been written there. It deals with problems facing the remnant and with glimpses of that new order of the ages through the establishment of the community of the Holy Spirit, which ultimately has come to be known as the church from the Greek Iglesia, the community of the called out ones. Always Isaiah is looking to the prophecy of that nucleus of the Sangha of the Buddha. Chapters 56 through 59 and 63 through 65 dwell on the exposure of evil, in particular the immoral practices by the leaders who yield to the desire of the masses for immoral indulgences as well as idolatry. The people want their indulgences, their idolatry, and they are always looking for a leader to confirm that the way of lust is permissible and confirmed by tradition or whatever law they can conjure up. You look at all the talk shows, they are the fallen ones convincing themselves with other fallen ones and the people watching the shows wanting to hear that it's all right to be indulgent, to go the way of the world. So when I see you, Isaiah's on that platform and in front of the TV and radio audiences, I know that the word of the Lord is speaking and that you will be heard. I also know that you are in a hostile environment, a hostile media, though you may find some children of light working there in the process. The media as a totality is an instrument to keep the people in their ignorance and their sensuality. And all, a lot of mockery, laughter, surface joking on the talk shows to keep the attention away from the real issues at hand. The section, the final section of 58, 61, 63, and 65 deal with the true spirit of the church as it is expressed in works of healing, peace, joy, and fruition. All that will come to pass as this community is once again reestablished. One day with the Lord, a thousand years, a thousand years is one day. What does it matter if what Isaiah foresees does not take place for another 2,500 years? He is caught up in the spirit. He sees the vision. The vision is now. He has no sense of time and space. He knows that vision will be the vision of everyone he can convince to go back to Jerusalem and enter the Holy of Holies and worship the one God. They will see it then, they will experience it then, and all those who enter like him into that higher consciousness in all the years to come will have the same experience. And ultimately there will be the remnant who will see it collectively as one unity, and because they are strengthened in their unity, they will manifest it physically. This section then was probably written at a time when Judah was part of the Persian Empire. Babylon collapses, Cyrus the Great, the head of Persia, comes in, and so the Jews are now under, under Persia. 
At this period, in the reign of the Persian Empire, regardless of where Isaiah was, Judah, its people, enjoyed the tolerant religious and political practices of the Persians. And there was a period of comparative peace for the Jews. That peace does not seem to have been the proper milieu for the alchemy of rallying against an enemy. A peaceful enemy is not identified as an enemy. So the people today in America are given certain freedoms and certain peace. And the freedom to worship is intact, a certain amount of freedom of speech, freedom to get in your car and ride here and there and take a vacation. And so this peaceful enemy in our midst is not identified as the enemy that corrupts the souls. It is a very clever combination of enslavement and freedom, ignorance, absence of education, and a mass popularity of the sensuality cult. So that is our overview, and we have yet to bring out the fullness of the word of Isaiah in our two days remaining. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, in the name of the Mother, seal our word within these hearts, O God. Seal our word within their souls. Lord Sana Kumara, the Ancient of Days, bring the former things to their remembrance. Bring to their remembrance now the inner walk with thee, the experience in the Holy of Holies, the moment of our vow in Venus. O Sanat Kumara, let the memory of the love we share in this table prepared in the wilderness linger with our hearts until America is free, earth is free, and each one so consecrated is ascended in the light. Rama Vishnu Shiva, Rama Vishnu Shiva, Rama Vishnu Shiva, go forth now, seal the heart in the memory of the Ancient of Days, seal the heart in the memory of the Ancient of Days, seal the heart, Rama Vishnu Shiva, of these thy blessed self, Seal the blessed self of each one in the memory of the Ancient of Days. Ganesha, seal the divine memory. Great divine director, seal the divine memory. In the name of the Father, the Mother, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, it is done. I'll give you now 15 minutes to have a break and Prepare yourselves to be wide awake for today's dictation. Thank you.
Yannesha Sharanam Sharanam Ganesha Yannesha Sharanam Sharanam Ganesha Yannesha Sharanam Sharanam Ganesha Yannesha Sharanam Sharanam Ganesha Yannesha Sharanam Sharanam Ganesha
You can come forward and put your letters in the basket yourselves. I come from India today, here to be a part of souls gathering more of the fire of self, and therefore more a part of myself, and of the brotherhood of the Himalayas, and our efforts of this century to bring a nucleus of devotees to the white light. We seek certain ones and we have sponsored quite a number of souls who have incarnated in the last 30 years to be links in the chain of being. Our first beams through Blavatsky came forth to contact as an experiment those who might work together in community. Therefore, the movement of Theosophy was born, and so were born other troubles as rivalries and jealousies of HPB 
and fragmented ones and others who were not true to the light proved to be both a help and a hindrance to the work. Yet by the dispensation of the great divine director and Serapis Bay and the brotherhood at Luxor, an offering was placed upon the altar of certain devotees who carried that offering in the name of humanity. I was there offering advice and counsel, wrestling with a human consciousness, dealing with time-worn doctrine of the West, and always attempting to hold the balance of chila ship. I direct your attention to this period in the history of our band so that you will pause briefly to consider the mood of the Master M and myself, which mood was a sense of mission, a fiery blade, a determination to work with individuals until they either became psychic or caught up in their own pride. The communications of our letters by direct precipitation or through HPB was of a different sort and yet very much the same as in this hour. Only certain of the ascended masters were permitted to reveal themselves in those days, for this was a part of the dispensation. When the master are coming then and sponsoring Saint Germain brought forth hierarchies of light for the word of the I am presence through Guy Ballard and his wife. There was an intensification and an expansion. Thus, for each spiral that was turned, a greater spiral could be turned. With small beginnings, we opened the door not necessarily with all winnings, but it was an opening of the door to the ancient wisdom, to the light firmly blazing of Sanat Kumara. When you compare yourselves today to the Chilas who came, came to India, came to our retreat, you might see that a century's difference in time and space has produced another dispensation. The light released from the central sun by comparison, though exquisite then, is now even more brilliant. Our messenger better qualified with greater karma balanced than HPB, our chilas drinking of the body and blood of Christ in a true mystical Christianity. Cups larger we perceive. And, and so we perceive that in this hour a greater blow can be struck for Moria, for Saint Germain, for Gautama, for the ineffable flame of Sanat Kumara. We see that many more are willing to withstand persecution and mockery. There is indeed greater sacrifice among greater numbers, yet we will not forget 
the early sacrifices, and many who sacrifice to the present for our memory without regard to our present person. And though they think they have the memory of us, we too evolve. Our adeptship moves on. Thus, in the office of world teacher, I am able to impart a greater light for the office itself, as you have heard, is self-transforming. I wear bigger shoes. Elephants have worn big shoes from the beginning. The question is, which shoes will you choose? The shoes of Ganesha are waiting and elfin feet are running, and salamanders are leaping, yet I stand, my head in the clouds with the mother, my heart in the central sun with Omega, my soul on the dusty road of life with your soul. I watch the politicians with their chicanery. I watch the old guard protecting not my flame, but their concept of my flame. I expose Krishnamurti in his game to deny our brotherhood. He was never chosen by us, though those who presented him to the world so said, can a leopard change his spots? He who is of the light in the beginning is of the light in the ending. And he who is of the darkness remains of the darkness still. Therefore watch and see how those endued with pride did not represent us in sponsoring him but only their own ulterior motives. Let us set the record straight. Lord Maitreya has not sponsored that one. And the coming Buddha has come. And the coming of that cosmic Christ in the ascended masters is reflected fragment by fragment in the face and heart of many chilas. We will not burden one chila with the allness of the cosmic Christ, lest the smallness of the lesser self attempt to swallow it up and say, I am the cosmic Christ. Well said indeed, if it be from the heart, but so often it is the ego who proclaims a serpent's name and a serpent's egg. I am come in the cosmic egg of the Virgin. I hear your prayers. I hear your call to implement a word you have suddenly heard, though it was always spoken in your heart. Suddenly you have come into the Lord's temple and you say, the Lord has suddenly come unto me, when in fact, he has been with you always, but he is grateful that you have come suddenly to your awareness to fulfill your facet of the grand design. I wish Chilas to know that the ascended masters are much, much more apart of what seems the daily trivia than you realize. We are men and women of the spirit. We deal directly with you and we are not removed into a corner, nor will we be, nor will we be framed and hung on the wall and left there to cobwebs and dust nor will we allow your souls to rust in the concept that you somehow are chained to a chain, a long, long chain, and on the end there is 
an infinitesimal image of someone you call Kuthumi. Nay, I will not be removed, and you will not therefore swallow the camels of daily trivia that become momentous events because you think they are outside of the realm of the master's eye and we do not see or care whether you live or die. We are concerned when you make mistakes and wrong choices, small and great. Thus submit all, not to fate, but to the great God self, of which we are a part, in whose name we impart to you our gift of consciousness and life. This is our messenger. We do not expect that you will go around the altar or behind and slip your letters in and hope to find a precipitated missive, a missile from our retreat when in the flesh and blood we can speak heart to heart. Many have said, I will pray about this, I will write to the ascended masters, and momentous problems come and go and hang on for months and years, and shedding many tears you waste time and eternity and energy and money itself when the teaching is well explained by our teachers and ministers and representatives and when a word yea or nay spoken through the messenger could spare you many a day of wandering in the wilderness and spare us the waiting and the grief for another chila to come to the center of the cosmic cross of white fire I do not expect then that you will inundate our messenger with questions that can well be resolved by the application of the law or which can be dealt with effectively by those whom she and Mark have trained in our name. By a like token, events cast themselves upon the skies and the astrology of tomorrow is made today and therefore do not circumvent the open door or set aside those moments and decisions of portent which will either close or open the gate of consciousness on the road ahead. Let us work together and strive together. We submit to the higher law our messenger submits. Therefore, do not expect that we or she will set aside the law of karma, of your fiery destiny, or the moral code required. The Lord God Almighty may wink when a devotee of long standing makes a mistake. But do not yourself make the mistake of indulgent behavior, thinking to ride upon some past or future glory. We do not dwell in either glory of the past or future. We cannot count on you for virtue undone or unspun. We cannot continue to laud you for yesteryears and other incarnations. We demand action now because the law demands action now. And upon your brow is written, is written a word of light upon that brow, the word of light. I know now who I am. I know now who I am. The third eye is for the crystallization of self-knowledge now. Now then let us see how you will be the fulfillment of your inner key. A key is there in waiting. It is the key to the lightning. It is the key to the teletype. It is the key for day-to-day -day spending of energy, word, wisely.
We are looking for, we are looking for, we are looking for you, O Chila, only if you are looking for us. We are looking for devotees who will glow white hot. There may be other stones that can fill in in the vast building we would construct. But the stones who glow white are the ones whom we enlist in this fight and to you we will give our attention, our time, our counsel. But if time and again you ask for counsel and go your way, there will come again a day when we will say, all right, have it your way. For your way, after all, will be the best teacher for you to understand the features of life and the fall. Beloved ones, sometimes the best lesson for the little child is to fall upon the ground and pick himself up again. Do not rationalize misbehavior because I give you an example. To say I had better learn my way is yet a rebellious statement. And you never know when God will let you fall as a little child, but not all the way. Or when he will let you go because you are no longer a child. You must not tamper with that law of eternity or allow the justifications of the mental body to ensnare you again. A great freedom is passed into your heart. A great light is come into you. And a people that have walked in darkness have seen a great light, a light great enough to illumine the darkest night of Earth's consciousness. I say, let it be sealed. I am the guardian of your light. I am the one who reveals to you how to impart the light to those who are students of the Ascended Masters. Remember always when you represent the world teachers. The students do not belong to you. They belong to us even as we know they are a sacred trust and do not belong to us, but to the living God, to the Ancient of Days, who also knows the sacred trust that they also belong only to the Almighty One, the great Sun behind the Sun. Therefore, as shepherds, feed the sheep, lead them not to thyself, but to the light shining, the light shining, oh, the light shining is the focal point of our one devotion in the oneness of all. Yes, we will teach you how to write the word, and we will teach the mother how to prepare the meal that the children will eat and not leave or cast aside. Beloved ones, it is the art of mother. Wed to the spirit to ponder how to feed the children nourishing food, how to prepare the food that they will take it in and assimilate it. Mothers of the world have this problem, but the mother of the spirit Praise long to know how to feed the children of light who have light, who have the Holy Spirit, and yet that Holy Spirit within them is, as it were, bound in chains of doctrine and dogma, still held dear by the soul who fears the Lord, yet cannot accelerate to the new vibration this is the handiwork of the fallen ones, the entrenched dogma. And you know how I dealt with it and how I spoke to it in those years. 
for it prevented the expansion of that dispensation. For hearts are true here on earth, but my beloved, they have lived in sustained ignorance for so long. Therefore I say, sing the new song. Sing to them the lullaby of the own. Sing to them the songs of the spirit. Oh, sing to them the songs of Excelsior. Sing to them of Lanello and the banner he bore and of that sign of light. Oh, the message brazing bright. The message blazing bright of Excelsior carried through the night by Lanello and many chilas. O oh, my beloved, now you have the word to hurl the miracle pouch into the midst of every foe of light. I stand here below. You have presented to me your letters and they are indeed the sacrifices of substance you do not need so that angelic hosts and mighty eagles can feed draw in as Kali the energy misqualified may it pass through the heart of mother this day and be transmuted and be returned. For my beloved, in the first instance, the Israelites, even Abraham and Isaac, called upon to sacrifice, are given the animal form as symbolical of the old consciousness that must go. When it is given in purity, when it is transmuted and returned, understand that the one who comes to the altar of sacrifice must take that light until the soul garmented in that light becomes one with Christ, becomes that Christ through the mediator Sanat Kumara, through the mediator Gautama, through the Mediator Maitreya, through the Mediator Jesus, through the Mediator Saint Germain. Hear me, and now understand the real meaning of the mystery of the sacrifice. For you have not yet given the sacrifice demanded, for you do not own it. You have not become it. Only Christ, crucified upon that cross is the ultimate acceptable offering. Do you understand? One day your only son, your Isaac, your son of God, your Christ consciousness must be placed freely upon that altar, upon that cross, and you within it to hang there. Thus you are in the age of preparing to make the sacrifice that Jesus made. Truly it was Christ, the second person of the Trinity, who was and is crucified. This is the ultimate price that is paid. And who makes the sacrifice? God in you and you in God. For in the hour of the crucifixion, you have already become the manifestation of that Christ. And therefore, the all of you, the temple, the whole, the fullness, the soul, the adept comes to the altar. And on that day, it is the willingness to pay the price, to bear world karma, to bear the sins of the world and be the one, be the one. Thus, the offering of this day is the acceptable offering of this day. I accept it in his name. The offering that is acceptable today 
will not be acceptable on the morrow. Understand the path of initiation. Understand the goal. The world will not crucify your human consciousness. They will crucify your divine consciousness when you have a divine consciousness. Understand the rungs of the ladder and the pilasters. Understand the positioning of the molecules. Have right assessment. Know God the all in all. Be realistic on the dusty road of life. Know what you are externalized and know your potential to externalize the whole, then go to it, do it, do it now. Get it over with, the painful parts will pass. Once you see the light in the door, go for it, run for it, leap for it, catch the ball of life that I hurl to you. No matter what they say, those demons of the night, there is no gain in putting off the soul's flight. God will not spare you glimpses of hell when you hang from the cross, nor will he spare you the faces of myriad millions who smile through tears of joy, for now they live because you have reached the hour of your initiation. You will see souls looking upon you at inner levels from every corner of the earth, praising God that the day of their salvation is come because you will have chosen to be truly not only with Christ on the cross, but to be Christ on the cross. God will not allow you there alone until you have reached the condensation, yea, even the crystallization of that fullness of himself in your heart. Let us be about our Father's business. There are too many waiting. We have already given our lifeline to those who were standing ready when we hung upon that cross. I shake your hand, for it is you who I saw when I myself participated in the crucifixion. Now you are here and I am there. Perhaps I am here and you are there. I have pulled you in on the lifeline of my heart that belongs to God. It is made all of love through and through. I see you as you are. I see you as living stars. I see what you shall be because you already are the fullness that I am. I know it but you do not. And this is the practical understanding. If you knew it, you would be it. And therefore the fullness of knowing, the knower and the known, is not yet in physical flesh and blood manifestation, but it can be. And the twinkling of an eye is a single embodiment the twinkling of an eye whose gaze is fixed upon the all-seeing eye. I take you to the moment of the finish line. In this moment I project a line into the future. There we are, the stadium, the crowds are cheering, and you are coming in, all winners in the race of life, and I am there and Jesus 
and Saint Germain. It is a future date. You can hear it and feel it. And in that moment, now I take you and project you into the distant past. This moment of my presence in the sanctuary of the Holy Grail. This moment now is past and you are a hundred years hence. Do you see how life can be a transfer on the timeline and you can be in the moment of victory even as you are in the moment of becoming? Do you see how you can project that moment, experience the cup and drink it and jump right back into the moment of the beginning? Why we do this all the time when we are saving worlds. It saves our sanity. We jump into the moment of victory. We, if you will, indulge it for a moment. And then we go back for we have set our sights and we know where we are going and we know that it is the accelerated line, the intensity that makes all things possible. And therefore the seeing does not cause us to delay. And the sense of victory does not cause in us relaxation, but instead a renewed determination that there is much to do between now and then. And perhaps, perhaps, perhaps if we do not intensify, we may not return to that moment that we have glimpsed. It all hangs in the balance of decision made moment by moment. Therefore, there is no trivial decision. We would not have you become psychological misfits by amplifying the dust of every moment as though it were a god. By a like token, you cannot set it aside and say, it is not important, it doesn't exist, when that very dust is preventing you from seeing clearly the immediate action. Sometimes you need to take your gaze away from the sun and help a neighbor cross the street of life. Little tasks well done, care and carefulness, marks of leaders, wasting not and wanting not, frugality, purity, cleanliness, manners, courtesy, grace, caring, sharing, speaking a kind word, and not leaving undone the finish of a task of any project you undertake. If you are not going to finish the task, don't begin it. Every task undone is another spiral that you will one day unspin or spin through. Beloved ones, get to the bottom of your consciousness. For heaven's sakes, expose your own foibles. If you have been doing the same thing year after year, must it be we who tell you? Can you not see in the mirror of life and say, for heaven's sakes, I have been doing these things for so long. I should be embarrassed for an angel to have to fly by wing and come to me and tell me a poem or sing me a song to woo me away from this little or great wrong. After all, when the word has gone forth for centuries, it is you who must decide to cast aside the darkness of the pit that overtakes you. Beloved ones, many elements and building blocks of consciousness make up, make up the individuality, the character of the true leader. Hearken then and look how every leader is able to handle the details of life as well as the major thrusts. The impractical leader is no leader the leader who cannot give account for money and books and organization is no leader, will betray you as he betrays his own light. The leader who will not organize himself
can never be in the midst of organization. The leader who cannot command his forces will not command his troops. Inner forces and resources daily channeling of these, the obvious components of leadership. If you do not possess these virtues, follow someone around who does. Get yourself in position of someone who is spiritually successful. Who are the ones who are spiritually successful? They are always materially successful as well, and yet not by the standards of this world. They are successful in the materialization of the God flame, according to his will and not man's will. I would recommend those who are leaders within this organization as a beginning. And I would also recommend individuals worthy in the world community. I would recommend that you study the chilas who are candidates for the ascension. Who are they? The members of this board, certain heads of departments, and some most humble who, though not in a leadership position, are quietly, with constancy and steadfastly, carrying the flame day by day. I would recommend that you begin to look not to distant stars, not merely to ascended masters, but those who will be ascended masters in a few years, if you are studying our previous incarnations, why not study the lives of those who are here now in a hundred years? Their incarnations will be glorified, and those who study them will see them with halos and auras of light and will not remember their rolling in the dust and wrestling with a carnal mind or this or that problem. Such is the dilemma of history and the keeping of the records of the saints. Therefore look around you, for there are key individuals here and in the teaching centers who keep the wheels of the movement turning, and without them there could no be there could be no burning in your heart or in my own. Key individuals keep the wheels turning. Those very ones have been criticized by those who seek the demigods, the plastic robots, the perfect people. Never mind them. Look at those who may be burdened and even be bowed down in carrying the cross. But watch the resiliency, watch how they are on their feet again for the next round. Those willing to be on the inside of the ring, what ring? The boxing ring, of course. The wrestling ring, of course. The wedding ring, of course. The circle of fire of Guru Chila. There are times when the guru wrestles with his chila inside that ring and never outside. But somehow it is easy to be a fan, to root for one or root for another. But beloved ones, the only place to be in life is in the ring itself, with courage, with honor. I tell you, the need for leadership is great, but let us not make it 
a call to idolatry or to personality. And let us not conceive of this as something remote. There are capable people here and now who will speak my word to you many, many times. Though you recognize it not and balk and rebel, our teachers have spoken the truth. And in that truth you have seen a flame of eternal youth, of purpose, guidance. But above all, you have the advantage of seeing how the mystical word, how the law, how the person of God and the soul becoming that person engages in the decision-making process. How did the prophets deal with the dilemmas of kings and tyrants? And how do our staff decide from day to day what to do and what not to do? If you could follow the logic of the mind of mother and the mind of Mark reflected in those whom they have trained, you would see firsthand the logic of the millions of decisions that you will make before your ascension hour. Right decision, on the spot decision, right action, on the spot action in far off lands will come from a steadfast studiousness watching the mechanism of the mind of God in action. This is real preparation for leadership. And it comes because you espouse the Holy Spirit and determine to be at Camelot until when we send you, there will not be a challenge or a crisis that you will not contain the elements for a right and a lasting decision. Peace in right action. Peace in the logos that is learned day by day. Peace in the love of the heart of the world teachers. We go to the altar to make intercession for you now to dedicate these letters to a higher sacrifice that you will make. I bid you as always Godspeed. Hear now, O lords of karma, hear now, ancient of days, four and twenty elders. We come in the name of the one eternal God. We come in the name of the great God, and we petition intercession for these souls. We stand sponsors of all who would be representatives of the world, teachers, guardian angels, angels of the presence of each one. Come now, gather in prayer with us on behalf of these souls who once went out of the way and who now come to follow the way and one day to be the way. Guardian angels, world teachers, sons and daughters of God, together we pray. Our Father who art in heaven, we stand before the Holy of Holies and we say, 
hallowed be thy name I am let the name I am be hallowed in these hearts and let it be sealed forever let the I am be the kingdom come let the I am be thy will be done and let each soul rise to take that dominion to vow to be that kingdom and that will in earth as it is in heaven let them receive the daily bread the sustenance of life even so let them give the daily bread morsel by morsel to the little ones let their sins be forgiven even as they forgive sin in the name of jesus christ let their sin be forgiven in proportion as the flame of mercy burns brightly in the heart let them be led out of the way of temptation yet when temptation come let them plunge the mighty sword of truth into the very heart of temptation and the tempter himself and let them lead the children of the light out of the way of the tempter until they too have the strength in god to consume the tempter and the way of life let them be delivered from the evil one yet let them be deliverers of the children of god delivering them by our flame from the evil one and the generation of watchers yet in the earth let them be delivered by the holy ghost and let the evil one be consumed by the sacred fire and the judgment they invoke thine o lord is the kingdom of their consciousness therefore sanat kumara by the order of the rose cross receive now their word inscribed from their hearts gautama buddha lord of the word receive and distill this writing let all that proceeds out of a pure heart and a practical dedication that will not fail receive the transmutation of our love and the anointing of our life thine is the power O god therefore take to thee this power released from each one as the surrender of the lesser self let power be unto him return to him transmuted and sealed in the heart of the messenger once again to be received by the devotees on the path of initiation that they might earn the right to use that power again and again proving daily their words by their works thine o god is the glory shekinah the i am that i am therefore let that glory be the expansion of the body and blood of christ i now project my presence here as the person of saint francis and with claire i take the communion cup on behalf of these souls the master has said drink ye all of it 
I therefore drink all of the cup of sorrows and sin, disease and death, which these souls have brought to the altar. I drink all of the cup of my master who has, is an hungered and thirsty and naked. I drink the cup of one despised and rejected of men. As I bid you to drink my cup of life, I am willing to drink your cup. This is the marriage of Francis and Claire to all of the devotees, devotees of our path. We are one in light, in spirit, and in matter. And you are one with us. And this is our marriage vow, as our souls are wed to him. I bear thy burden, Lord. I bear the burden of thy witness, thy prophecy. And I bear the burden of these children whose burden must be borne until they come of age. I am Saint Francis. This is my prayer. I am Kuthumi. This is my way. Lo, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Fiery salamanders, mighty seraphim, consume now this sacrifice upon the altar and let the message of love poured out from each soul reach the heart of the great God. Sheila's of the will of God, I am thy mediator. I am in Claire, thy mediatrix. Amen. May the ushers now take the letters to be burned. Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, in the name of the Mother, Amen.
In the name of the I am that I am, I salute the ancient of days. I call forth the mighty light rays from the sacred fire heart of the Lamb of God. Beloved Sanat Kumara, come forth. Come into the earth and consume all that is unlike thee. Let the light of the ruby ray descend from thy heart through the blessed heart of Gautama, Maitreya, Jesus, the two witnesses and the saints. Blaze forth thy ever-present light thy effervescent elixir of peace blaze forth the intensity of the father mother god within each chila in the name of the i am that i am we stand in the earth we invoke the light of the pleiades consume all anti-Christ, anti-sun manifestations. O oh, sacred fire from the very heart of the living word, consume now by that sacred fire, burn into the cause and core of all intrigue and treachery within church and state, within the nations, within the chakras of the earth, Blaze the light of Elohim. 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 O living word, descend now by the full power of the sacred fire. Strip now from these auras and these force fields all substance that is not of the true light of freedom. Blaze for the violet flame of the heart of Saint Germain. O purple fiery heart of Saint Germain. O purple fiery heart of Saint Germain, praise for the living word, praise for the living word, praise for the living word. The light of God never fails, the light of God never fails, the light of God never fails. So enter now the holy city, enter now the new Jerusalem, enter now the secret chamber of the heart. Beloved mighty Estrella, lock your cosmic circle and sort of the same into and around the cause and core of all opposition to the victory of the light in the heart of every child upon this earth, every child of God. O living word, descend and cut them free, cut them free and cut them free by the action of Alpha and Omega, the seven mighty Elohim, the seven beloved archangels and the seven beloved Joans of the race. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit and the Mother, Amen. Good afternoon, everyone. Please be seated. We'll close the doors. There was a great miracle that happened in the life of Hezekiah through the hand of the prophet. I have personally witnessed this miracle happen in my life through the ascended masters and through the word of Mark prophet. And the miracle is the extension of life. When individuals are in the process of creating good karma and the wheels of life are turning in a momentum of service, it often happens that their days are lengthened. When they are misqualifying energy, it often happens that their days are shortened and cut off before the appointed hour. Let me close the door, please.
I have seen this occur in the lives of people who have determined to render an extraordinary service for the Brotherhood. The reason that this is so important is that you are on a path and desirous of balancing at least 51% of your karma so that you will not have to re-embody. And that is not for a selfish reason. It is because you know that when you maximize that light, you become an electrode that thousands and millions of others may do the same. You become the means for the elevation of planetary consciousness. So the ascension is never a selfish goal, but it is a goal of intense love that realizes the only real victory for anyone that you can give is the victory of the self. So when people need a few more years of service in order to complete the requirements for the ascension, it is important to understand that the law of God has on many occasions extended the life of God's servants. And so it occurred in the life of Hezekiah, recorded in chapter 38. Yet chapter 39 records that he is rebuked for his folly of exposing the light of his attainment in his material focuses, and the Babylonian captivity is prophesied. So there is the understanding that a soul working out his karma, showing sincerity before God, may receive dispensations on one hand, and those dispensations ought not to be a cause for pride because one has been healed or given additional opportunity, but one can still be rebuked and chastened even though one is indeed earning a certain attainment on the path. So Hezekiah is someone that you can compare to yourself on the road to becoming the fullness of Isaiah. He is taking the lessons and the chastening of Isaiah. Isaiah is functioning as his guru. And in those days when Hezekiah was sick unto death, Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, came unto him and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Set thine house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. Setting one's house in order usually means taking care of one's affairs, one's personal matters, financial matters, saying one's prayers, and in some religions, the last rites, uh, making one's peace with God. So Isaiah is reading the law and the record of his karma. Prepare yourself for your final hours upon earth. Then Hezekiah turned his face toward the wall and prayed unto the Lord. And so he took from Isaiah the counsel, and the first point of setting his house in order was prayer. And he said to God, Remember now, O Lord, I beseech thee, how I have walked before thee in truth and with a perfect heart, and have done that which is good in thy sight. And Hezekiah wept sore. Now he is a good lawyer in his defense before the bar of justice, before the karmic board. Some saints would pray about themselves as being a sinner, but Hezekiah sees himself as walking in truth and having a perfect heart. We take it that he is sincere in his self-assessment, and in as much as he can ascertain, he has walked to the best of his ability. And so he weeps at the thought of his passing, his helplessness before the inexorable law of God. Then came the word of the Lord to Isaiah, saying, Go and say to Hezekiah, Thus saith the Lord, the God of David thy father, I have heard thy prayer, I have seen thy tears. Behold, I will add unto thy days fifteen years. And I will deliver thee and this city out of the hand of the king of Assyria, 
and I will defend this city. And this shall be a sign unto thee from the Lord, that the Lord will do this thing that he hath spoken. Behold, I will bring again the shadow of the degrees, which has gone down in the sundial of Ahaz, ten degrees backward. So the sun returned ten degrees, by which degrees it was gone down. The sundial of the life of Hezekiah, his own karma, his own astrology, his life is turned back fifteen years. The writing of Hezekiah, king of Judah, when he had been sick and was recovered of his sickness. I said in the cutting off of my days, I shall go to the gates of the grave. I am deprived of the residue of my years. I said I shall not see the Lord, even the Lord, in the land of the living. I shall behold man no more with the inhabitants of the world. Mine age is departed and is removed from me as a shepherd's tent. I have cut off like a weaver my life. He will cut me off with pining sickness. From day even to night wilt thou make an end of me. I reckoned till morning. I reckoned till morning that as a lion, so will he break all my bones. From day even to night wilt thou make an end of me. Like a crane or a swallow, so did I chatter. I did mourn as a dove, mine eyes fail with looking upward. O Lord, I am oppressed, undertake for me. What shall I say? He hath both spoken unto me, and himself hath done it. I shall go softly all my years in the bitterness of my soul. O Lord, by these things men live, and in all these things is the life of my spirit. So wilt thou recover me and make me to live. He was in the fullness of his lamentation. The Lord healed him, and he said, I will go softly in the bitterness of my soul. He will not be such a complainer all the rest of his life, for God has given to him this opportunity for service for the balancing of karma. Behold, for peace I had great bitterness, but thou hast in love to my soul delivered it from the pit of corruption, for thou hast cast all my sins behind thy back. For the grave cannot praise thee, death cannot celebrate thee, they that go down into the pit cannot hope for thy truth. The living, the living, he shall praise thee, as I do this day, the Father to the children shall make known thy truth. The Lord was ready to save me, therefore we will sing my songs to the stringed instruments all the days of our life in the house of the Lord. For Isaiah had said, Let them take a lump of figs and lay it for a plaster upon the boil, and he shall recover. Hezekiah also had said, What is the sign that I shall go up to the house of the Lord? Hezekiah did not recover simply because he prayed. He prayed, God answered him through the prophet, his guru, the instrument, and because God's word was spoken in matter, it was crystallized in matter. You begin to realize the function of Isaiah or of Elijah or of Elisha, and you realize that there are many such healings in the Old Testament, and they are the first faint gleams of the light of the dawn of the full-orbed Christ consciousness in the person of Christ Jesus. They saw in part and prophesied in part. They saw through a face darkly, but Jesus Christ was the one who beheld face to face and had the fullness of that Christ consciousness unmistakably. 
some of these healings one could pass by and say well he would have lived in any case but when you take the full complement of the Messiah come you find all of the ingredients of all of the prophets who have gone before and you find that it cannot be denied and yet even though it is unmistakable that segment of the life wave of earth who has denied his coming whether they are Jew or Gentile or any race they deny because they will not acknowledge the living Christ in themselves or any other person they become anti-God and there is no miracle and no healing that will convince them because they will not because they remain the stiff-necked generation you will understand that individually in any number of cases the ascended masters have interceded for their chilas but on a large scale they have not brought the miracles of mass healing or of phenomena to be the means of captivating the mass consciousness every one of you must realize that as shepherds of the people you must not be tempted to perform works for the sake of gaining converts you get into the area of the end justifying the means and pretty soon by a stretch of the mind and the imagination you can point to people like Jim Jones who to show his healings took parts of chickens and so forth to illustrate the healing and removal of tumors and cancers to gullible people the end justifies the means if people come to the worship of God what does it matter if they are fooled because it increases their faith and so the desire for visible numbers the desire for large masses of people how often when you represent your church you are asked how many members in your church people ask me how many followers do you have and God warned Solomon not to number the people and that was the sin of Solomon that he numbered he counted the people when you are counting people you lose sight of the oneness of God you lose you lose sight of Yahweh and the moving presence of the I am that I am in the midst of the people you lose sight of the fact that God is the doer and you can justify many philosophies especially the watering down of the teaching for the masses why does the Catholic Church have so many people because there is very little that is required in the deeper penetration of the mysteries of God very little sacrifice of the self required you may be required to go to mass but mass may last 15 minutes once a week it's amazing to see the compromises that have occurred in the churches to gain or sustain membership all the way to the bringing in of rock music in the churches today when we traveled in South America we saw the complete compromise of the Catholic Church there is not a church there that does not combine the popular beliefs of the people including the killing of animals animal sacrifices the burying of animals under buildings taking the fetuses of of lambs or sheep and when a building is built planting these in one in each corner all kinds of witchcraft and black magic allowed and assimilated and taken in to the church of Jesus Christ now you can understand why the apostate church is called the great whore because the great whore will share the light of Omega with anyone and everything and allow all things to enter in and pollute the stream and therefore become incapable of giving birth to the man child so the true representatives of God are willing to wait upon the Lord and if the Lord's miracle takes a year or ten years they do not go after other gods 
or psychic phenomena or all sorts of interim measures and say, well, we have the ascended masters, but when we need this or that, we go here or there. We've had keepers of the flame in the past year who actually fell for the church of Hakim in San Francisco, where you bring in your money and he multiplies it by four or more times. And this individual, using the teachings of the law of the abundant life and supply, had masses of people coming to his church, bringing in quantities of money, and for a while he could give back many times their money, but of course the cycle runs out. There is no investment that can give the great returns that he was giving, except it be organized crime or gambling or drug trafficking. And so these keepers of the flame, in order to be a member of the church, had to be willing to become pastors of the church to avoid the IRS income tax uh, uh, e equation in the matter. This they were also willing to do because they said we will get our money multiplied and give it to Camelot. And that's a case of the end, giving money to Camelot, justifying the dishonest means. I rebuked them and I told them that they were a whoring after other gods. And if they were going to be the bride of Saint Germain, they would have to wait upon Saint Germain as their true husband. And as he gave forth the miracles, they must be willing to receive them. And if there were no miracles forthcoming, then they would have to give greater application. Well, would you believe it? Some of these people went behind my back and secretly reinvested in the church. And I told them that if they did so, anyone who remained in that church becoming a minister of it would be excommunicated from Church Universal and Triumph. And I could not allow them to be communicants of Jesus' inner church and, and join another church. Have you ever heard such a thing? And then go ahead and be ordained in another church on top of it for filthy lucre's sake. And that's Elmoria's words. Comes out of the New Testament, but that's exactly how he came down. He said this man was preaching the word of God for filthy lucre's sake. And you would be amazed how people are tempted to believe that somehow in the midst of all of this scandalous activity, there is somehow the thread of the Ascended Master's consciousness working. You can't have two things. You can't have dishonesty and the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a person. The Ascended Master whom we know as the Maha Chohan is the one who holds the position in hierarchy for the carrying of the flame of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit will shun you if you have this tendency to be mentally dishonest, devious, justifying those activities which are not justifiable. Now when you have come for your blessings, and I've placed the stone upon the third eye, I notice these tendencies in your aura. You cannot hide a vein of dishonesty. You cannot hide it. Now the reading of the aura is what you have been to the present. Your aura can change and reflect a purified heart. But you cannot reserve the possibility that should it become necessary, you will engage in dishonest practices on the path of the ascension. And you must know quite clearly that no, no temporary or short-term gains are worth the compromise of living truth. Truth is compromised when you exaggerate. If you exaggerate spiritual experiences, embellishing experiences because you say, well, if I embellish it, I'll get more converts, you lose the Holy Ghost. You lose the power to transmit the word. And there you are abandoned on the platform and you give your talk by yourself because the Holy Spirit is not going to speak through you. Now these little tendencies that we have to cover over are very much ingrained in the human consciousness. And in one form or another, one form or another, most people grow up with this wrong habit pattern. And some people who are very sweet and childlike uh, various groups of people that I know, sometimes the Ghanaians are this way. They feel that somehow I will not be happy if they tell me the truth about burdensome conditions and problems they are having or certain people's failures. 
So they tell me all of the nice stories and they omit to tell me the things that I should know in order to do the work. Well, they have improved greatly, the members of the church, since I began scolding them and rebuking them on this matter. The point of exaggeration is there also. And so, you see, you cannot do this, even if you do it as children, even as if you do it seemingly innocently. You have to have a clean line before your mighty I am presence. And if I ask you a question concerning your life, you should be willing to answer. I've had people on the path and students, when I ask them questions about their uses of energy and the light of God, they have refused to tell me. Well, that shows an inappropriate relationship. If you can't tell me, well, who are you hiding from? Do you think your mighty I am presence does not know what you are doing? Well, the, the human mind, the carnal mind, has devious patterns. And those devious patterns today permeate the churches. It is unbelievable, but they do. And for the sake of amassing money, you find those healing services that carry on and carry on and work up to emotional frenzies when people finally believe that they are healed by the psychological mechanism of their minds, and it goes on and on and on on the TV and radio stations. Of course, there are some who have that Holy Spirit, but anyone who has the Holy Spirit and keeps it has the cosmic honor flame, and that honor flame is the light of God. You may walk with Jesus Christ and have sins and be dishonest. You may have a contact with the Father and even with the Mother, but there is no permanent indwelling of the Holy Ghost when there is deviousness of character. There is none and there is no guru, however high and mighty, who can be an exception to that rule, and you will find that this is always the absence in the false gurus. They do not have the honor flame, they do not have the Holy Spirit, and therefore they must resort to the enticement and the captivating of lesser spirits to convey energy, and they use those spirits to carry out their wishes, even their death wishes or other manipulative states of consciousness in order to prove that they indeed have the power of God. So there is the point, you see. If individuals can work phenomena of all sorts, it is not the ultimate sign that the individual is of God. Just because you see a healing, just because you see someone such as another false guru, the Swami Rama, stop his heartbeat, this does not mean that the man is an initiate of the Great White Brotherhood, that he has the true attainment of the light. 